Pen and Teller Foolers is a show that I absolutely love. In fact, one of my earliest memories of being a magician and starting out doing the hobby was coming home from school and watching an episode of Pen and Teller Foolers. I remember watching and re-watching that over and over again, just trying to figure out how the tricks were done and being obsessed with it. Still to this day, I absolutely love the show and Foolers is one of the longest running magic shows ever. It's run for over nine series and in that time there have been a lot of magicians. And the show hasn't been without its fair share of controversy. And that's what I want to get into today because I'm going to talk you through five acts that have caused some disagreement and debate in amongst the magic community as to whether or not they really deserve that Fooler's Trophy. Accusations that they broke the rules or scammed Penn and Teller or simply didn't play fair. I'm going to count you down the top five controversial Penn and Teller Fooler's moments. I feel like Watch Mojo doing a top five video, but these are seriously interesting stories and there's going to be some discussion in the comments as to what you think about this. So coming in at number five then, we have Morgan and West, a Victorian magic duo that have a really cool presentation style, really, really unique. You don't really get many acts like Morgan and West and they went on Penn and Teller and this happened. Marvin, you can go and sit down over there for me, Mr. Ross. That's splendid. I'll put these down. And hold your hand up nice and flat for me. Now, any magician watching that looks at that particular moment of the trick and assumes that a deck switch has happened, right? Because Jonathan Ross moves in front of one of the magicians and they do this dodgy little move that really just screams deck switch and not even a good one at that. So obviously when Penn and Teller give their guess at the end, Penn looks them in the eye and says, you did a deck switch. And there's this really weird moment where Morgan and West go, no, we didn't. And Penn basically goes, well, you did, because I saw it. <laughs> and it's this strange back and forth. They didn't do a deck switch, but they really looked like they did. There was no deck switch. Well, we saw you do it. Online afterwards, there was some discussion as to whether Morgan and West had done this on purpose. If they'd thrown in a red herring, or what's sometimes known as a false method, into the trick in order to lead Penn and Teller astray and make them think they'd used a deck switch, when they hadn't. It was one of the earliest cases of this happening in the show, there's a couple of other examples later, and to be honest, when I watch it, I'm not entirely sure if it's even intentional or not. And that's why I put it at number five in the list, because Morgan and West do genuinely seem almost apologetic that they accidentally put this in there. Did you, just to monkey with us, do a move that looked tricky in order to lead us astray? No, no. Oh, you didn't? But as we'll come to later, there are some people who definitely did do this, on purpose. But moving on to number four, we have Ivan Amodi. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that name correctly. Ivan does this trick where he has a load of people up on stage and cards with different states of the United States that he hands out at random and basically he's able to tell people which state they have. It's a great little piece and there's also a cello playing in the corner for some reason, not really sure why, but it's a nice routine and it's not the most fooling thing in the world. I think for most magicians watching it, you can have a basic understanding of what's going on. And at the end, Penn obviously gives the guess, and he says what a lot of magicians are probably thinking. Uh -huh. That there seems to be a little less clumping than there should have been if that was truly random. Personally, when I watch the routine and when I hear what Penn says at the end, yeah, it kind of seems like Penn is on the right tracks and he has the method down. He knows exactly what is going on. But then there's this weird sort of moment. Ivan doesn't know if Penn has got it right, and there's one part of the trick they're not sure on, and then Penn gets interrupted halfway through his explanation. It's all a bit odd. Ivan does fool them on this strange technicality of Penn and Taylor not quite getting the right wording of one part of the trick. I still don't really understand how this fooled them. I've watched it a couple of times to try and understand what goes on here, and I honestly don't know, but it's important to note at this point that there is a third party magician who deals with these sort of disputes. It used to be Johnny Thompson. Basically, there's a judge off stage who knows how the trick is done and therefore can say whether something has or hasn't fooled Penn and Teller. And in this case, with Ivan's routine, I honestly think it was just a bad call from the judge. <laughs> I think Penn and Teller knew how this trick was done and somewhere along the way, communication broke down and there's even talk of editing playing a part in that online, but. Whatever the story happened, Ivan got the Fooler's Trophy and it's up to us to debate whether or not he deserved it. Coming in at number three, we have Nick Einhorn. 
Now, Nick Einhorn is a fantastic magician, and here is where we get to some of the rules of Penn and Teller Fool Us, because there are some rules that the magicians have to follow in order to be on the show. The first rule is no pre-show. You're not allowed to prepare anything or set anything up with the spectators, which is fair enough. And the second one is no actors or stooges or plants in the audience to help you do the tricks. I think those two methods are kind of out of the window in Penn and Teller Fool Us because they're almost too powerful. The show would just get ridiculous and anything would be possible. Now, in Nick Einhorn's routine, there isn't any pre-show. He hasn't prepared anything with the audience at all. And there also aren't any actors. So you might be thinking, what's wrong with his routine then? If those two things aren't used, surely that's fine. But there's... <laughs> How do I, how do I say this without giving away his method? Please, Daniel, slowly and clearly to read your message. A man by the name of Daniel will be asked to sit at table number one. It's tricky to explain this without, without sort of hinting at the method. Basically, they are following instructions, right? That's all I'll say. They're, they're, they're following instructions and a tricky spectator could really mess this up in a way Massive respect to Nick Einhorn for going on Penn and Teller Foolers and doing a routine that is actually genuinely risky. I can think of some spectators I've had in the past that I definitely would not trust with a routine like this because they would absolutely mess it up and the trick would just not work. Do I personally think that Nick Einhorn broke the rules? No. No, I don't, but I know a lot of magicians who do think that, and that's why it's included in the list. I put it in the mid-place position, third place, because there are some people who were annoyed that he was allowed to get away with this, when other magicians wouldn't dare go near that, because it's very, very close to breaking the rules. But in a way, you've kind of got to respect him for doing it, and trying, and getting away with it as well. I mean, <laughs> he fooled Penn and Teller, and rightly so. So, moving on to the second place position. Lung and Brynolf. I'm sure I'm butchering their names, apologies, but Lung and Brynolf are another magic duo who went on Penn and Teller Foolers and did, honestly, a fantastic routine. But then... Neatly folded four times. Now, if this is really your card, then it's a pretty good trick. Once again, any magician who knows anything about magic, even non-magicians who I've shown this to and said, what do you think is happening here, have said correctly what they think is happening. A switch, right? And not even a good switch at that, a really obvious switch where it, it's just awful. You watch it and it, it's just like the most blatant thing in the world. But you guessed it, this is a controversy because that wasn't a switch. <laughs> Did you do a card switch? No, no, no. at all. That was not a switch, that was just a movement added in to look suspicious. The, the reddest of red herrings. Is that really fair? In a program where you are trying to fool magicians to throw something in that deliberately sends them to a completely different method, for me, is just not in the spirit of the show. Yes, there isn't technically a rule against it, but the only thing it does is highlights your insecurity about the effect. Clearly, it's not good enough to stand up on its own. It needs this big, obvious thing to draw all the attention so that technically it fools Penn and Teller, but not really. To me, a fooling trick is when you have no idea how it could possibly be done, not thinking you know, but it's a trick within a trick and the rug has been pulled from your feet and aha, it was actually done a completely different way. That's just, what is the point of that? You know what you're doing. That's the Lung and Brynolf controversy in a nutshell. It is time for the number one slot. The number one most controversial contestant on Penn and Teller Foolers, and I'm sure already many of you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jay Sankey. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of hurts me to say this because I really respect Jay Sankey. I think he's a brilliant magician, brilliant performer and creative mind in the magic industry. He has created and produced more magic than any other magician and he's a great guy. I've met him in person. He's absolutely great. He's a lovely chap. But my god, his Penn and Teller Fooler's act did not sit right with me. If you don't know the story, essentially Jay Sankey goes onto the show and he starts to do very basic tricks that are all loosely connected around the theme of fire, right? There's a candle in the middle of the table. He does these tricks that are supposedly caused by fire. He does rising card, he does tournament restored card, he does a uh, ring through straw, sparkler through deck. It's a lot of tricks, right? Most magicians just kind of do one trick, you know, see if this fools you, but Jay Sankey comes in with multiple sucker punches, multiple attempts almost to try and fool Penn and Teller, but the tricks are basic. 
Like, with the rising card, it's very obvious that there's some sort of thread between the card and him as he sort of leans, it's rising the card up, and then when he does the Torn and Restored, he's doing this old move, where obviously you're switching something behind the back of your neck. It's a rubbish old move that I really don't like it. It just obviously screams that you're switching or ditching something. Penn and Teller take the bait. They see the obvious beginner methods that Jay Sankey is using. They call him out on it and Jay Sankey accepts. He doesn't say anything. It's not a bait and switch. It's not a ha ha, I got you moment. He simply exits the stage to applause. So what's the controversy here? Well, after he was on Penn and Teller Foolers, he makes a video on his YouTube channel entitled something similar to How I Secretly Fooled Penn and Teller. Now, this video, as well as his original performance, have both been taken off YouTube. So whether that shows that Jay Sankey has changed his mind since, who knows? But in that video, I very clearly remember him saying how in each of the tricks, he was pretending to use a different method. He was essentially using a false method, but in multiple tricks. Talk about red herrings. Jay Sankey has swept his net into the ocean and caught a whole bag of them. So yeah, in the rising card trick where it looked like he was using thread, there was actually a hole cut in the deck and he was using his thumb to push the card up. And in the torn and restored thing, he didn't need to go behind his neck. The trick used an entirely different method. Why? Why do it then? <laughs> I mean, it is so pointless. A lot of magicians were understandably annoyed by this. Why did Jay Sankey not say something at the time? Why did he even do this in the first place? He's a very creative magician. He could fool Penn and Teller if he wanted to. He has got more than enough ideas that are incredibly fooling. Again, there isn't a rule against this sort of thing, but it's just not fair game, is it? I mean, anyone could go out there and do that. Litter their performances with a hundred different false methods so that Penn and Teller have to try and guess which one was the real one because it looked like he did a switch and then it looked like he did a palm but maybe he wasn't palming anything. It takes the fun out of the show for everyone. So yeah, there we go. Those are the top five controversies of Penn and Teller Foolers. Let me know if I missed any down in the comments and tell me what you think about these events and magicians. Did they deserve the Penn and Teller Foolers trophy or not? And if you enjoyed this, make sure to hit the thumbs up button down below. That really does help me out. And you can subscribe to the channel if you're new and you like anything to do with magic. Here on the channel, I teach magic, talk about it, react to it, review it, discuss anything and all things to do with magic. So if you like magic or you're a magician, make sure to subscribe. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next video. Until then, take care.